Hey guys, how are you? Okay, so in this video I'm going to cover the part of the bioenergetics that says redox reactions in living things. Okay, um, I want to say that I won't be giving you the presentation link from this video because 90% um, of the information I put in this video, in this presentation, is taken from a single website. So instead, I'm going to give you the link of the website where you can read all these, these things in a text-wise manner. Okay, so don't ever bother to look at this video because I'm just presenting what in, is there. Just go to the site and read it. Now, if you're more of a listening type of guy, go ahead and watch this video. Okay, so let's get going. First of all, redox reaction. Redox stands for re as in reduction and ox as in oxidation. We will see what these are. But before that happens, um, let me tell you something about redox reactions or generally reactions. Reactions um, involve the transfer of electrons. Now you see electrons, like energy, is neither, are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. So we need some substances to give electrons and a substance to take electrons. So this is a mutual relationship. Oxidation we call the loss of electrons and reduction the gain of electrons. So, in order for a reaction to happen, some, something needs to give electrons and, some, and, and the substance needs to take electrons. So you see that re reduction and oxidation occur simultaneously and to the same extent. Okay? Now, because oxidation and reduction occur simultaneously, they are, refer they are referred to as oxidation reduction reactions or for brevity we call them redox reactions. Now you see redox reactions occur in nearly every area of chemistry and biology but in biological systems when we say oxidation we mean the removal of a hydrogen and reduction the addition of a hydrogen to molecules or polyatomic ions. In chemistry, you will see that we get three types of oxidation reduction. The one is that, three definitions for oxidation reaction. The one is that, the second one is that, and the third one is about oxidation number. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. I want you to know that from now on, when we say oxidation, we mean the removal of hydrogen and reduction, the addition of hydrogen. Okay. Now you see, when um, give me a second, yes, energy productions. We need energy. The biological systems need energy, and this energy is released from redox reactions. So we take a compound, it reacts, it either gives electrons or takes electrons, and during this give and take of electrons, we've got the energy, energy to be released. Of course, all these reactions are catalyzed by enzymes, we will we'll later see how are they called. Now, the most common organic compound used as substrate for energy production is glucose. We see how cells use glucose, glucose in order to create energy or to say it better, to store energy in ATP molecules, okay? And we saw how they are doing that through glycolization, uh, the link reaction, Krebs cycle, electron transport chains, and oxidative phosphorylation in aerobes or um, in anaerobes through glycolization, and then we've got fermentation. Okay, but why glucose? Let's talk a little more about glucose. You see, when one mole of glucose equivalent to 180 grams 
is burned in air under non-biological conditions, 674 kilocal of energy is liberated as heat and waste products, CO2 and water. You see, when glucose is used as a substrate for aerobic respiration by an organism, the same amount of energy is liberated and the products are CO2 and water again. But you see, in respiration, only a part of the liberated energy is converted to chemical energy and the rest is lost as heat. Okay, you need to understand this concept. Why? That not all part of the energy is converted to chemical energy and some is lost as heat. There is a question in Ahmad that says um, to calculate the percentage of energy that was created in IP when one substance was burned. Actually, let me read you that question, if I may. Mm, just give me one second, please. Yes, you see, it says, a food item was burned in pure oxygen and released 830 kilojoules of energy. An identical food item of the same mass was found to produce 8 ATPs in respiration. Assuming it takes 31 kilojoules to produce one ATP molecule, estimate the efficiency of respiration. Someone would say, why wouldn't it be 100%? Because not all the energy liberated is converted to ATP. So out of the 830 kilojoules, we see that we have produced 8, 8 ATP molecules. Therefore, 8 times 31 ATP molecules. Okay. Um, gives us a number. Give me a second. It's uh, 100... 248 kilojoules. So out of the 830 kilojoules that would be of the energy released, only the 240 kilojoules are being converted to chemical energy and the rest is lost as heat. So you find the percentage of, third, of um, 240 kilojoules over 830 kilojoules, which is about 30%, and this is the efficiency of respiration. Okay, so you need to know that in order to solve that exercise. Let's move on now. You see, we said that glu glucose releases energy, actually 674 kilocalories of energy, a number that I would like personally to know. Where is that energy hidden? You see, glucose or any other molecule has the energy stored in the electrons that form the chemical bonds between atoms constituting the molecule. Energy is required for binding the atoms together and it is stored in the chemical bonds as chemical potentially energy. When these bonds are broken, energy is liberated in usable form. Now, the amount of energy that can be set free from a molecule is known as its free energy, as its free energy and conventionally designated as G. In a hypothetical reaction, if the reactants A and B produce products C and D, then the difference between the total free energy of A and B, G1, and between the total free energy of C and D, G2, is called the free energy change, and is, it is designated as delta G. And this is the time that gives you delta G. Um, delta G under standard conditions what are standard conditions? when both reactants and products are present in one molar concentration at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius under one atmosphere pressure then it is called standard free energy change and we represent it with delta G plus this little cycle which indicates the standard let's move on now you see, this is the delta um, G, which is called the free energy change. 
which is G2 minus G1. A chemical or a biochemical reaction um, has an energy difference. This is why it happens from a G2, from a G1, we go to a G2. Now, if the G2 is of higher energy, and how is that possible? We are talking about the energy of the system. So when the energy is inside the molecules, the system does not have energy. But when the energy is released out of these molecules, the system has energy. So if energy is released from the reactants, therefore the product system has energy, the reaction is exogenic. And this is, this is how the reaction is called. And it happens when G2 is bigger, larger, it contains more energy than G1. And delta G is negative in that case. A chemical or a biochemical reaction can run spontaneously only when it's exergonic. That means delta G is negative. In other words, a reaction will run spontaneously till the free energy change, delta G, assumes the value of zero. And in that stage, the reaction will lead to the equilibrium. At equilibrium, the concentration of the reactants and products are such that the total free energy contents of the reactants and products are equal. Now let's talk a little bit about redox reactions. Such reactions are catalyzed by the enzymes called dehydrogenase. Okay, about that we have talked previously. You see, energy released by exergonic reaction is utilized to drive endergonic reactions and also for other purposes, such as locomotion. The transfer of energy from one reaction to another takes place via some common reactants, which take part in both the exergonic and the endergonic reactions. Substances with high transfer potentials are called energy rich rich compounds. The most common of these types of substances is ATP. So it is it has a high transfer potential and this is and this is why it is used not to save energy but in order to transfer energy. And it's not suitable for storing energy because it is a large molecule. Instead, glucose is a much more suitable. It's a much more suitable um, compound to save energy because the potential energy of glucose no because it is a smaller molecule okay now the potential energy of glucose has to be released through breakdown of molecule in a stepwise manner by catabolic reactions which we saw in the previous video okay and with that sentence I'm going to end this today's video. I urge you to hit that thumb to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. And also if you've got any questions, just send me a message on Facebook or um, write it in the comments. Any questions regarding IMAT I'm willing to answer. Even if I have not covered the material yet in my videos and I know this, uh, I will be very glad to help you. Because if you send me your questions you help me prepare as well because it's practice for me so it really helps me don't be shy or you see that question is stupid i don't care i have no problem explaining something that you may think it's stupid for you it's complex and i completely understand that because i am myself a student and i know that i would like to have someone to help me even if my in, in my very stupid questions so you help me if i know to answer them i will Thank you so much and please hit that thumbs up button. Bye bye.